Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on planning your organic farm for profit, presented by Richard Wiswall of Cape Farm in East Montpelier, Vermont. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We are a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You will be able to find the recording of this webinar, information about our upcoming webinars, as well as articles, videos, and more by going to our website at www.extension.org slash organic underscore production. We are very excited to have Richard Wiswall as our speaker today. Richard started Kate Farm in 1981. Known for his work on farm profitability and appropriate business tools, Wiswall consults with other farmers and writes and speaks frequently on organic farm business issues. He also authored the book, The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. In this webinar, Richard will provide a step-by-step -step guide to achieving a healthy bottom line, assessing markets, and developing a production plan, a roadmap of how to grow what you plan to sell. Richard will also share techniques for discovering your profit centers. Now I'll hand things over to you, Richard. Well, hi, everyone. Um, a little background about myself. I've been farming organically for 29 years. My wife and I manage Cape Farm here in Vermont. Uh, it's 148 acres with 22 acres in cultivation, seven 100-foot greenhouses, two of which are potato plants and five of in-ground production. And of the 22 acres of field crops, about a third are row crops, about two-thirds are planted into small grains and, small grains and cover crops. We hire three employees March through November, plus extra hands when needed during the summer. And we sell to local wholesale markets, uh, one farmer's market in Montpelier, and to a grower's wholesale co-op called Deep Root Organic Truck Farmers, which brings produce down to Boston and New York metropolitan areas. We used to have a CSA and also grow a kind of a wide variety, everything all the time, do a milk run around Montpelier in central Vermont. But now we've kind of uh, have a less um, diverse product mix right now. I usually start in with a few photos, oops, a few photos uh, to kind of give some meaning to the sometimes dry material of business planning. And I think record keeping often gets a bad rap. Um, but you know, it's really not too bad if you kind of break it down into smaller pieces. If there's one thing I want you to learn today, it's this. Profit equals income minus expense. This is the irrefutable business equation. It sounds simple enough. But how is this different? Or this? Farmers, this is the way farmers tend to work. The top one is more of an income of a CSA model where you will, you know, garner a lot of money up front in the beginning of the season and spend it and then be, have profit if it's left over. And the second line is usually what happens in a non-CSA model where you'll spend money during the growing season, you'll then uh, gain some income and then uh, have profit left over. But in both, profit is what's left over. And if it's small, we are really good at rationalizing in a way by saying, well, at least I didn't have to commute to work. I didn't have to buy fancy clothes. You know, my kids are here by my side. But in general, it's, you're kind of taking what's left over. So the, the basic equation, profit equals income minus expense, is only calculated usually once at the end of the year and primarily for tax purposes. And it's also for the whole farm. In reality, it's the, actually the average of a bunch of smaller pieces of your farm that contribute to this year-end equation. There may be some things on the farm that you do have a pretty good profit because they've got a good in income but very little expenses. There could be some things that have a very small profit because they have kind of Muted. income and expenses. And there's some things on their farm that might actually lose money because the expenses are bigger than your income, and so on. You have different uh, profit centers, or actually uh, negative profit centers, um, depending on what you do. 
It could be, you know, carrots versus potatoes versus laying hens versus dairy animals versus blueberries. All of them have their different profit equals income minus expense equations. And the chances of them all being exactly the same are incredibly low. So let's start with the overall profit equation. How much money do you want to make in that profit? Instead of saying what or seeing what's left over at the end of the year, how much money do you want to make? Now, everyone's different. You know, you have to kind of compare yourself to your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, school teachers, or other tradespeople in your area. And we all have a kind of a sense of what we deserve for the amount of work we do and the amount of knowledge we have. So think about it. Think about how much money do you want to make in that profit. Ultimately, how will you ever achieve your financial goals if you don't have a financial goal? So take a second, write down on the corner of your paper a net profit that you'd be happy with or that you think you deserve. So for illustration purposes, I'm going to just say you want to make $30,000 in net profit. And it could be anything. You could fill any number in there. And it may not happen tomorrow, so I kind of drew a four-year timeline to give us some time to get from where we are now to where the $30,000 net profit is. So how much gross sales will it take for you to net $30,000? $60,000, $90,000, Well, that's a real tough question, and it depends a lot on what you do. But guaranteed, to net $30,000, you're going to have to gross more than $30,000. We're going to address later on how you can actually determine the gross to net ratio. But right now, the idea is to get in kind of a rough, road, a rough road map of where to go, where you are now, to where you want to be to meet your financial goals. So where are you currently? You could be. Um, grossing $30,000 and netting $2,000. You could be grossing $80,000 and, gro and netting $2,000. You could be grossing $300,000 and netting $25,000. It could be anywhere. Gross sales and net profits can be all over the board. So example purposes, let's just say it takes $60,000 to support a $30,000 net. Um, now, take where you are in Currently, and again, this could be anywhere, but let's say you're grossing $10,000 a year now, netting $2,000. So with this timeline, you can kind of guesstimate, fill in the blanks to see where you need to be in each year in order to gradually build up to your net profit of $30,000, which is your target goal. Again, remember to keep your eye on the correct moving object. You want to be focusing on net profit if that's where your financial goal is. So you can just fill in the years roughly to see you know, what those numbers might look like in the future. Again, these are projections. But it kind of gets your head wrapped around the whole idea of how many sales you need to actually start garnering in order to, to capture your net profit and build your net profit over the years. So now, if I want to make my net $30,000 and I need to gross $60,000, the big question is, well, where are all these gross sales figures going to come from? We have to somehow sell that much product in order to net this much money on the second line. So what I do is kind of construct a marketing chart which kind of breaks down piece by piece. Again, we're trying to break this down into smaller pieces to make it a little easier to, to understand. I look at the farmer's market and I say I can sell 25 pounds a week for eight weeks during farmer's market. That's 200 pounds of beets. And that's that first this uh, seller right there. And they get $2 a pound of market. That's $400. Food co-op. You don't want to figure out right now. The restaurant, I know, will buy 25 pounds for 12 weeks, which is a total of 300 pounds, but I only get a dollar a pound, so that's $300. So then, so far, I've got, for my total, 500 pounds worth about $700. Boy, it seems like a long way to go to make my $30,000. Well, 
where make my sixty thousand dollars. But it's a start. And generally, you know, you may have maybe thirty or forty crops down this way, and you may have ten or more accounts across the top. But this is basic start. Another way of doing it would be if you sold animals. I did the first line is meat birds. You know, say the average bird weighs four hundred four and a half pounds dressed, you get three thirty three a pound, about fifteen dollars a bird. And I sell some on the farm, I sell some to a neighboring CSA, I sell others to another account. And so I say I do eight hundred birds, that's twelve thousand dollars. That's getting me a lot closer to my sixty thousand dollar gross sales figure. But it can be made up of any different things, meat birds, any other kind of animals, or any kind of crops. So once you get some information going, you can actually put it together so you can have a more comprehensive sales spreadsheet. And what I do here is I list a few different accounts across the top and um, have totals on the end here as well as totals on, as down along the bottom. This is like a very important one-page piece of information which kind of describes my farm to anyone concisely where, what I'm growing and where it's going. So for farmer's market, if this is, if this is all I was selling, I'd be doing $3,300 at farmer's market, $6,800 at food co-op, $1,700 to the restaurant, et cetera, et cetera, and they all add up to $19,325. Similarly, the beets, you know, I'm adding up the beets at the farmer's market, the food co-op, restaurant, CSA, and other. I have 1,200 pounds total for a value of $1,600. They all add up again to $19,000. So I can tell quickly where my money's coming from, where what crops it's coming from, and what account it's coming from. Again, it, the first one's the hardest to make, but once it's done, it's very easy to tweak year after year. And um, it, it, it's a great summation of your whole farm plan. Let's see. Slide, please. So, how do I get, I know that I need 1,200 pounds of beets. If I go back a slide, um, no, I can't do that. Let's see, if I go back a slide, I know that I need 1,200 pounds of beets to produce for my farm plan. So how am I going to get those 1,200 pounds of beets? So it, this is what I want to be selling. How do I get there? Should I be planting two rows or three rows per bed? Should I be planting, you know, 700 foot beds? How many seeds per row foot am I going to plant? What varieties? What am I going to plant them? Do I do split plantings? How much seed do I need to order to get my 1,200 pounds of beets? All this information is needed to actually grow the crop. And what I do is I just make a simple production plan, which allows me to kind of put all the things that are, need to be in one place on a chart. And so for beets, I need 1,200 pounds of beets. And, you know, I'm figuring a yield 600 pounds per 350-foot bed. I need two beds in order to get my 1,200 pounds. I do one early and one late. The gross sales will be $1,600 the seed needed for each variety, and then the planting dates, I do split plantings, and then I make any notes that say I want 15 live seeds per foot. So this is a kind of plan. I do this for every crop that I grow, and it's a one page that I could hand any farmer, and they could actually carry out my farm plan in order to meet my target market. And one of the most important things about this one piece of paper is this total bed number or total acreage number. It basically says how much land will you need in order to
grow what you think your target market will take. Okay, in this example, a simplified example, I need 16 beds. So do I have 16 beds? Do I have more than 16 beds? So what I do is I end up taking a piece of paper, and I usually use these kind of lecture pads, which are like two feet by three feet, and I put them on my wall, and I kind of map it out where I can uh, draw it on um, bed by bed where things are going to go. And I take into account things like rotations and row covers and irrigation and deer pressure and rotations from past years and how things will be planted and come out. So there are a lot of factors that go into designing a map. But it's one way you can make sure that everything that you intend to sell, that you're going to produce, is actually on a piece of paper and will fit on your land base. And again, it's a simple representation of your production plan, kind of in a visual way. And I keep this in my office wall, and I actually write on the actual map things as they happen. So on May 1st, it was you know pouring rain, so I didn't get the, I might say over here, actually planted you know May 7th, or actually planted May 27th on the second line. So I have a sense of what's you know, what really happened. So, so far so good. I've got my beets planted, I've got my carrots, I've got my lettuce planted here, I've got my potatoes planted here, and I've got some cover crops planted here. Everything is going according to plan. I'm growing what I think I can sell, I'm planning for it, and mapping it on my fields. You know, I seed my beets, I seed my carrots, I plant my potatoes, and then I go to plant my lettuce, and hmm, where are my lettuce plants? Not something you're likely to pick up at the local convenience store. Unfortunately, most farmers don't have the ability to buy lettuce plants locally quickly whenever they want, and so we have to produce our own. And so it, it's not hard, but we need to have some way of planning for the crops that we transplant. And what I do is I just have a seedling calendar, which allows me to plan ahead for the plants that will be needed to transplant. So for instance, if I need 750 lettuce plants on May 1st, I back up three or four weeks to how long a lettuce plant needs to grow in order to get to that size. And at the end of March or the beginning of April, I seed 750 lettuce plants. And that way, when May 1st comes and I go out to the field, you know, to transplant my lettuce, I already have these lettuce transplants in the greenhouse ready to go. And so any, any crop that you need to be transplanting, you need to be putting on this seedling calendar. Again, it could be anywhere from 10 to 600 crops long. And usually I start at the beginning of the season in March or sometimes February, January and go through the season when your last transplant is seeded. I tend to use these bookkeeping ledgers, which are uh, kind of legal size, with multi-columns that are shaded green and, and pale green. So let's do a quick little review so far. The idea is that we want to plan for net profit. So to meet your financial goals, you want to be able to have a financial goal. You'll need to have a sense of how you're going to get to that financial goal. In order to have sales to meet that financial goal, you need to kind of determine your market. You need to see what you're going to grow and who you're going to grow it for in, in quantities so you have a gross sales figure for planning your net profit. Once you know what you're going to grow, you have to kind of figure out how you're going to grow it. Your production plan will kind of just be a simple uh, two or three lines per crop that you want to uh, say what important things you'll need to do to produce that crop. And then once you know how much you're going to produce, you'll need to be able to have a map or some form that you can make sure that you will be able to have enough land available to plan all this and where it's going to go. And then lastly, you'll have a seedling calendar for any crops that you'll be needing to transplant. The idea is that you do this planning 
kind of in the off season when you're kind of more cool and collected and determining the market and figuring out what you're going to grow and mapping it all out ahead of time. So come middle of June when you say, boy, I've got an extra pound of carrot seed and there's two beds next door that are already going, I'll just drop the seeds in the ground. You end up spending a lot of time growing those carrots, you know, weeding them, and then not having a market for them. Flooding Unmuted. Selling them at a fire sale price, it helps no one. So it's better to, you know, always, you know, target what you're going to plant according to what you're going to sell. Um, so we've looked at the profit side of the equation of the profit equals income minus expense, kind of roughing out the production to Muted. what net profit we need to make. So now let's look at the other, the next variable, the income variable. There's different ways money can come into the farm. There's CSA sales, farmer's market, farm stand, and invoice sales to wholesale accounts. Now, invoice sales are kind of easy. They're kind of standard operating procedure, kind of a commonplace practice in any business where you will go to your account, list the things you're selling, you know, two bags of beets, four bags of carrots, two boxes of potatoes, and total it up, and then the produce buyer or account manager will sign for it, and whether they pay for it or not, will give you a copy, and they keep a copy, and then you have a paper record of exactly what you sold. Easy enough to tabulate later by pencil or on a computer. CSA and farmer's market, though, are a little different. With a CSA, a lot of times you'll, you know, you'll take money from a coupon, from a coupon that you may have sent out, get a check, and then in the end you'll have, you know, your checkbook filled with checks, but you don't really have a breakdown of what that money represents. You just say, well, we sold 50 shares for you know, $25,000 but we don't really know what went into that $25,000. Same thing with the farmer's market. We'll you know, load up for market, drive to market, vend all day, and then pack up for market and kind of rushing to get home to unload to, to go into the next task. And we don't really you know, have any sense of what we actually sold. We may know what uh, amount of money we sold, you know, gross sales at the farmer's market, but don't really know how many bunches of radishes or pounds of tomatoes we actually sold there. So, <clears throat> me, same thing with the farm stand. Now, tracking these uh, CSA and farmer's market and farm stands are not hard nor time consuming. I think it's just a matter of doing it kind of as it happens. For, for example, a CSA, we all make shares up for the week or biweekly share to our customers kind of depending on what's in season or what's available. And so we, you know, we write them down a chalkboard, and the customers come and pick up their share. So all we need to do is just record that information in a spiral brown notebook or a piece of paper and put it in a file just to say what was going out the door. We need to say one head of lettuce, two peppers, two onions, two pounds of carrots, you know, a bunch of flowers, et cetera. And you could even put in a value at that point, you know, saying a head of lettuce is worth two dollars, a bunch of radishes is worth a dollar fifty and do the totaling there then, but a lot of times you don't need to bother totaling things at the, at right then and there. You just want to have it written down so you can later on during the off season when you do have time to do some calculations and contemplation, you have that information at, at hand. For a farmer's market, it's kind of the same thing. The two things you need for a farmer's market is a beginning inventory sheet and an ending inventory sheet. Generally, when we load for market, we already have a list of what we think we can sell, so we bring it, we write it on a clipboard, simple yellow piece of paper on a clipboard, we write down how many boxes of tomatoes or beets or potatoes we bring. And so all you need to do is 15 minutes before the end of market is to, you know, look around the stand and say, well, what's left? And say, well, we have one box of tomatoes left, we have 18 bunches of radishes left, we have four bunches of beets left, and just write that down. You don't have to do the subtraction math now. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do is have a record of what you've left, and you can do all that math later. Same thing with a farm stand. You, what's, what's there at the beginning of the day, anything you add, you add to that, and then subtract whatever's left at the end of the day. So it's not hard to do. It doesn't take a lot of time, 
but it does kind of mean a little contemporaneous work of doing it regularly. So once you have all this information from your invoice sales, which you can break down pretty easily, your CSA and farmer's market and farm stand sales, you can actually compile all your sales into a simple spreadsheet, which looks very similar to your marketing chart. It's where you actually sold. And so you can total up all the beats you sold at market, all the food co-op through invoices, through the CSA, through your book that you've been keeping, your spiral brown notebook, if, if that's what it is, and any other sales. And so you get a total number of beats that you sold, in this case, $1,680 worth of beats. You can do the same thing with carrots, lettuce, and potatoes. And then you get a grand total of everything you sold. And you get a grand total, again, of all the accounts. And, you know, in a perfect world, the marketing chart and the sales spreadsheet would be exactly the same, but that's probably never going to happen. But it, you know, the marketing chart is kind of a, a budget, and this is the reality. This is a very important piece of paper for monitoring growth in sales or just general business health. Again, you can compare this year to year and see which accounts are increasing, decreasing, which crops are increasing, which ones are decreasing. So now, for the last variable, expenses. You know, expenses can be paid by check or cash, and those are pretty easy to track because there's already a paper trail with them. You go to the store, you buy something, they give you a receipt, whether you pay for check, cash, or even a credit card, you have a piece of paper saying what it was. You buy seed, you buy fertilizer, you buy boxes and bags to put your crops in. All that's kind of recorded. But what about all the expenses in between seeding a crop and actually collecting the sales money from it? So say for the labor seeding or weeding, cultivating it or harvesting it. You know, what about your time? You need to have a way to track labor and all these other expenses in crops. What I do is I have a crop journal, and the crop journal is probably the most important book on my farm because it tracks all these expenses where nowhere else does. In a sense, my employee's paid labor is recorded. It has, does have a paper trail in the form of a paycheck. But that paycheck doesn't really do anything except tell me that 40 hours a week at a certain amount of dollars per hour equals this much in wages. It doesn't tell me how much time was spent you know, on beets or carrots or potatoes, it just tells me the gross amount. Same thing with my labor. You know, I worked all year, but, you know, where did all that time go? So, it's, again, a simple, and it doesn't take that much time or effort, way of tracking all these things is just to have a simple, you know, pocket folder with some loose leaf papers in it. And what I do is I'll just put down alphabetically all the crops or enterprises that I do you know, one page for beets, one page for carrots, one page for eggplant, et cetera. And then any time I do something that, you know, concerns that crop, I write it down. It's not hard. It usually, I usually write down the date, you know, what I did and how long it took. I'm very, I pay important, you know, it's important to pay attention to rates, things like, you know, how long did it take an area per hour or how many seeds per foot or how many um, bushels per bed foot, anything like that. So you have a kind of two variables that you can use to do figuring with later on. So it's easy because all you need to do is keep a piece of paper and a pen in your pocket and wear a watch. And, or you can designate an employee to do that and make that part of their job description. And at, usually at the end of the day or every other day is to record the things that you did on the farm and then write it down on this crop journal. And again, you can do all the figuring later on in the off season when you have time to do it. So here's an example of a crop journal. And unfortunately, I had it, it's in type and it would be much more effective if you saw my hand scribbling. It would look much more real. But um, 
generally I just write down, you know, here April 23rd, I spread compost and some sopo mag and some poultry compost. I dissed it in. And I usually will just say it took me, you know, half an hour to do this and half an hour on the tractor when necessary. And then I chiseled and bed formed it once. And then I seeded some carrot seeds. And I make little notes of the plant junior hole. If, if, you know, so I can come back and say, is that a good hole for next time? Or, you know, so I, I can remember these things. So the next time I do the same task, I'll be uh, better prepared. I flame weed, I cultivate with baskets, I irrigate, I have a crew come in to hand weed, you know, finish hand weeding and, you know, cultivating. And so I list all these expenses and I don't really, I'm doing any, I'm not doing anything here except kind of just writing down the date, what it is and how many hours it took and if it involved a tractor or a piece of machinery. Usually the sofa mag and the compost and poultry compost, I know what they cost, I can just look up in my receipts. So once you kind of have all the information of income expenses broken down for each crop, you can make a simple budget. And it's, it, it, this is kind of a bare bones budget, and there's no overhead costs in here, things like you know, telephone or web page or uh, advertising expenses. It's kind of a simple production cost. And I'd list them kind of chronologically how they Happen. So first you prepare the soil, you seed, you cultivate, you harvest, and then you har post-harvest and list expenses. And then when you sell them, you have income of sales. You know, some are sold retail, some are sold wholesale at less money per unit. And then I have a total sales figure. So again, I'll start at the top here. Preparing soil, I was here. Um, the labor rate was uh, 12.55 an hour. That was half an hour. Machinery costs. I, for simplicity, I just said five dollars an hour, and the product cost came from my receipt. And so I list all these different labor costs. I list all the machinery costs that were involved and all the product costs. And I do that for preparing soil, cultivation, harvest. And so I get total expenses down here of, you know. 1463 in labor, 37 in machinery, and 317 in product for a total expense of $1,800 versus the income of 57. So the net profit per quarter acre is about $3,900 before fixed costs are taken into account. That's not too bad for a quarter acre. That means an acre would be over $15,000 net profit before taking into account overhead costs. So I'm thinking things are looking pretty good. The big question now, of course, would be, well, how does that compare to all the other things that I do? Is it in the middle of the pack, or is it really high and, and an anomaly, or is it actually a real low thing and everything else is making more money than my carrots? I had no idea. So I sat down and I looked at all the different things and I made budgets. And you know what I would recommend doing for anyone would be to take maybe their five top sellers and doing budgets. So at least your top earners, your top gross sales items, would be tracked in order to say which ones are paying more. Because if you're selling a ton of things that are losing money, well, you might want to rethink that plan in terms of making your net profit goals a reality. So one thing I do is. I have people do like a simple budget. And these are two things that a lot of farms have, you know, layers or meat, they raise meat birds. And so I'm not going to do this right now, but you can come back and look at this slide and actually try doing this for your own um, exercise to say, well, do I make any money, grow, you know, selling eggs? How much do I need to charge for a dozen eggs in order to make money? Same thing with meat birds. How much do I really need to charge in order for me to break even or make money? And I put in here, you know, labor rate of $15 an hour, which everybody says, well, I don't get paid $15 an hour, and, um, you know, my kids do it, so I don't need to charge any labor for that. And, and that's true, um, but we, only, we all share the fact that we only have 24 hours in a day. Some of it we need for sleep, some for eating, and some for family. And so 
of those hours that are left, I really think it's better to make the best use of those hours. And if you find that certain things aren't paying you anything and other things are paying you at least $15 an hour or whatever you think you need to make, then I would probably tend to do the things that uh, you need to support yourself with. So in this exercise, they're relatively simple. And it kind of gets your feet wet in terms of how to do other ones. Now, the first budgets are usually always the hardest. Um, and you, when you do a budget, you're going to kind of come across things like, well, how much does it really cost to grow a flat of lettuce or a flat of basil? And how much does it cost to, you know, you know, load up a van that's partially paid for and all the tables and chairs and, you know, go to market and come back and, you know, amortize all that equipment? And you know, how much does that really cost? There's a lot of questions that come up, and I think, you know, the first one is the hardest, but once you do one, the other ones are much, uh, much more of a snap because you already have figured all that out beforehand. So a couple of questions come up. Basic stuff, how much does it run, cost to run a tractor or produce transplants or vend at a farmer's market and deliver to wholesale accounts, irrigate a field, or just pay for all the overhead costs, things like mortgage, taxes, phone, advertising, office supplies, and labor upkeep, and kind of for managing your business end of things. So what I did was, instead of everyone figuring out all on their own by themselves, I kind of uh, did, made some worksheets. These are available um, in the back of uh, the book that I wrote and also on the CD that's included, so you can actually punch in your own numbers depending on uh, what your labor rates are or other costs are. So you can just tailor it to your own farm and get a real sense of um, what numbers are good for you. I'm going to go over these four worksheets that are kind of kind of a uh, prelude to doing a budget. And then I'll go over two budgets which are very similar in uh, growing uh, broccoli and kale, same family, kind of same planting requirements and everything else, and um, show you how that all works. And it, there's a lot of information on these pages, and I don't want to get bogged down by looking at it all. There's a lot of fine print, which I wanted to tuck in there just to give you some background information. Um, but for here, let's start at the top. Labor costs, you know, I figured, you know, $10 an hour plus some other employee taxes, workers comp, non-assigned time. You know, you're gonna, it's going to cost you twelve fifty-five an hour for a ten dollar an hour laborer. Delivery costs the same way. You, you load the truck. You charge yourself for mileage. Um, cost for one delivery is thirty-three ten. Now that's that's whether the truck is empty or full. So you have to remember that. You know, obviously it's better when it's full. Farmers market cost, same thing. Loading the market, traveling to market, you know, four hours vending, this is for two people, packing up, coming home, the vehicle cost, rental fees, amortized equipment. So, you know, the subtotal of the cost for one market is $246. This is $246 that costs you to go to market, whether you sell nothing or you sell $2,000. So if you're selling less than $246, you know, you're losing money or you're not paying yourself and your farmers are great. Uh, people at self-exploiting themselves by not paying themselves something. And that's where, uh, unfortunately, uh, we end up making money is by working tons of hours for a very, very little money. So just remember that. And then overhead costs, uh, there's all sorts of things. Let me go back one. Overhead costs, you have mortgage payments, depreciation, property tax insurance, all those kind of things add up. And so in in this example, you know, they add up to $19,000. Now, $19,000 um, is a lot of money for overhead costs, and it includes some labor to manage a business. But this cost has to get spread out onto the things that you do somewhere, or you're going to have to get an off-farm job to pay for these overhead costs. And so what I do is I split it between, you know, it's a five-acre operation with two greenhouses. So um, some of it goes to each greenhouse, and some of it goes to each acre that's grown so I can actually put down, you know, for two 350-foot beds, you know, $288 is needed to pay for all the overhead costs. 
And then to figure out how much it costs to grow a flat of seedlings, I first had to figure out, well, how much is the, the cost of the flat, the soil, the labor to fill the flat all end up? And so I did a simple calculation for a 606, which is six six packs, you know, the cost of the plastic, you know, how many yard containers are in a yard, price of the yard of soil, how much the soil in that um, 606 trade costs, how many, how long does it take to fill a flat, and then labor rate. And so at the end, you have $1.32 a cost, you know, to fill a flat, a 606 with soil. And so then I'll know that when I try to actually figure out what I'm growing bedding plant-wise. And I know I'm running out of time here, um, but I'll be quick. It just basically says, you know, what the structure cost is, and annual expenses like electricity and fuel and watering labor. I have an annual expense for a greenhouse of $5,000, and I know that I can fit 2,000 flats in that. And so I've got an annual you know, expense for a flat is like 259 And so then I add in some other things like the cost of seed and the flat. And it's costing about you know, eight, 7 to $10 for a flat, just so you know. Same thing with the greenhouse tomatoes. You can look at these later, um, how much it costs. And then I do the same thing with tractors, um, kind of taking the original cost of the tractor, dividing by the useful life, getting an annual cost, taking, adding in annual repairs, adding in annual fuel. I get a total annual cost. It cost me $260 to own, $1,260 to own a John Deere 2240 tractor. I divide by the amount of hours I use, 200 hours cost me about $6.30 per hour. Now, that's not bad. You think that, you know, it's one of those things that jumps out of you, like my Ford 4000 cost me $3.19 an hour. You know, you think of a tractor costing $50 an hour or something, but to actually own a tractor is not that expensive, especially if you use it for, you know, two, 300 hours. If you only use it for five hours, all of a sudden it becomes very expensive per hour. Same thing with implement costs and irrigation costs. I'll let you look at that later on. And so then here's a crop budget for broccoli, which is also on the CD, which you can actually change the numbers. It's kind of the same format where you have labor, machinery costs, and product costs, and done chronologically of preparing soil, transplanting, cultivating. And so if you were to go down to the bottom, you'll, you can see the sales, you know, some, re, some wholesale, some uh, retail. $900 worth of sales for, you know, two 350-foot beds. So the net profit is about $116 or about $1,100 per acre if you were to if you extrapolate it out. So then you take your cousin, Kale, and you look at it, and the gross sales for the same area is much higher. And then the net profit is much higher to yielding $24,000 net profit per acre. This is after all expenses are taken care of. This is including, you know, marketing costs, delivery costs, uh, overhead costs. This is, you know, a money maker that very few people ever uncover, especially when it's sitting right next to broccoli, which, you know, you're thinking intuitively the same, but they're very, very different beasts. So I have just a few things that I'm going to go over and then open up to questions. Um, I work with uh, different farmers, and there's a few quick fixes that I see can help um, solve some problems. One thing I'd like to do is set up some systems right away get a crop journal, you know, whether it's a spiral bound book or a pocket folder, do whatever, start one and just start, you know, writing some information down. Keep your eye on the ball of what you want to do. You don't want to take up all the information possible, just take up information you need to track expenses. So the same thing, you CSA log a farmer's market inventory sheets that you can put into a folder for later um, compilation, same thing with a farm stand. Again, not hard to do. And you know, use duplicate invoices or even triplicate. But duplicate invoices work fine where you can you know, always get a signature from the buyer when you receive it. And I always write 
paid, if they're paying you, say paid cash, paid check number such and such, and if it's not paid, write not paid. So there's no confusion later on when they say, well, I thought he paid you cash, and you forgot to write it down, but just be clear saying not paid, and that way you'll never have a, a problem with that. And then I like to keep designate a mother checkbook, which is kind of the center of all financial transactions. So any money that comes in and out of your farm is in one place. You just have to go to your mother checkbook, your farm checkbook, register to know when money came in or when money came out. So if you pay off a loan, you know, from your mother checkbook, it would be there. And if you pay a personal expense out of a mother check out of your farm checkbook, it would still be there. And um, you don't have to go hunting around, you know, the, maybe the three or four different bank accounts that you may have on your farm. And you want to be careful of the tax effect because, you know, if you were to, say you're going to town, making a delivery, you've got your checkbook and you, you're running an empty and you pay $45 cash for some gasoline. You go home and if you don't record that $45 cash as a farm expense, your income will be $45 higher at the end of the year. Now, it's hard to take, but, you know, self-employed businesses pay 15% roughly on, on federal income tax on their profit. They pay both sides of Social Security, which adds up to another 15.3%, and the state is around 4%. So you're paying 34% of any net profit to taxes. And so by not recording that $45 in fuel that I paid cash for, I'm going to actually pay $15 to various tax, um, uh, tax institutions. Now, $15 may not seem like a lot, but it adds up if you don't you know, keep track of all your cash expenditures. And so you want to make sure that you expense all bona fide farm expenses, whether they're cash or check or any, any other way. And one thing I do to, with this mother checkbook idea is that actually if I pay cash $45 for fuel on the road, I will actually come back and write a check to myself from the farm checkbook for $45. So again, it's all there in one place. And then lastly, I try to set up my desk for paper trails so it's not uh, a total disarray of different papers that kind of become a nightmare and headache later on. And so the paper trails that I'm concerned with are some things that need resting spots for unpaid invoices until they get paid, bills to pay in before they get paid, and payments that kind of rest until they get deposited. And generally, I don't do this every time I open the mail. I do this once a week on a set date so I have time to do it and make sure it gets done. And once they get processed, I do a, a paid bills folder and finish deposits to the bank, employee records, and insurance policies. And so, you know, and this is the end of the show for here. This is just a picture of my desk where it doesn't have to be, you know, a lot of um, papers all over the place. I just basically, when I get checks in the mail or I come back from farmer's market with my tout, my inventory sheet, I'll put it in my payments for deposit. If I get bills to pay in the mail or from wherever, I'll put it in this folder and once a week I'll pay my bills. Any, I try to set up accounts with any place I spend money regularly because that way they can, I only write 12 checks a year to them. They do all the paperwork for me and then I just pay once a month. Same thing with credit card slips here. I will just you know, use my credit card for personal and farm expenses and I can just put them there. Again, I write 12 checks a year at most from the column of my de desk. And then unpaid invoice. Unmuted. Or be here, and so I know right away which uh, accounts owe me money, and if any are late. If I get paid at delivery, they would get folded with the check in payments for deposit, and then I make a deposit once a week. So that's it for now. Um,